And tonight we are hosting my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Fred Smith, who is a historian, a historical archeologist, a connoisseur and lover of rum and all cool things in the Atlantic world. And he is the author of, oh, you can't see it. I have to hold it in front of me. Here we go, Caribbean rum, <laughs> social and economic history. You know, these little cool, virtual backgrounds are great until you try to do things like that. Um, this book is fantastic. I highly recommend buying it. And I have to admit, Fred, so this came out in 2005 and I was in grad school. And at that point, you know, I could only read stuff that I needed to read for my classes and, you know, you know, grad school, especially getting your doctorate. So I didn't read it and I knew about it and I knew your work and I've seen you giving talks, uh, give talks on rum, but my goodness, I'm working on, I just finished up the great courses, uh, series on the history of sugar that I'm doing this summer. And I read, I, I have a lecture on rum and I was like, okay, I think it's time to read my buddy Fred's book. And Fred, this book is fantastic. You write so beautifully. It's written so anyone can pick it up and read it. And the breadth of, of topics and voices that you cover is phenomenal. I am still reading it and it's, it's one of the best, best books I've ever read. So thank you, Kelly. That's very sweet of you to say that and um so and i will try to cover as much of that as possible tonight <laughs> i've also uh, been adding some new uh sort of working on a new uh sort of work on cultural representations of rum and sort of uh, popular culture or media thing so yeah interesting I'm still, still still i mean it's just such a interesting Alcohol is such an interesting topic and there's just so many ways you can go with it, so. I agree. All right, well, nobody signed on here to listen to me blab on about how great you are. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you show them yourself. So welcome Fred Smith. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my research with you tonight. And uh, thank you, Dr. Dietz, Kelly, uh, who I have known for 25 years now um, and uh, done a lot of uh, research and a lot of conferences together. Uh, also like to thank uh, Judy Hinson for sending me some great uh, uh, documents about uh, Stratford Hall and the, um, the incredibly varied alcohol inventory uh, that the Lees had in the late 18th century, mid 18th century. And also give a shout out to all the mothers out there for Mother's Day. If you're celebrating tomorrow, I hope everybody, we, uh, I'm sure I, I, my mother uh, drank a lot after uh, raising me uh, and in the process of raising me. So maybe that helped lead to this research. So, <laughs> so let me just, uh, I'll share my screen and give me the, my talk. I'm going to go ahead and black myself out so they can just see you. Okay. And uh, please let me know if uh, you guys have any problems with the sound or let Kelly know and we can try and um, figure that out or if you have any problems seeing the images. So just to uh, give you a little background uh, about myself and my research, um, I am a uh, professor in the Department of Liberal Studies at North Carolina a and State University, which is the largest historically black uh, college and university in the United States. And I've been there now for about four years and, um, and still doing research primarily in the island of Barbados. And I'll talk to you about that uh, specifically. Thank you, Joe. And so these are my two books. Uh, 2005, Caribbean Rum, 2008, The Archaeology of Alcohol and Drinking. Um, and my interest really began as a result of an event that happened at a construction site in Barbados in 1995, when construction workers, uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Florida, and I was down there uh, doing research for my dissertation, and some construction workers had unearthed an unmarked burial ground in uh, the capital of Bridgetown. And we went down there and um, sure enough, they had uncovered uh, this unmarked burial ground. Um, 
and the construction workers first thing they did was brought out a bottle of rum and poured it uh, into the graves uh, um, and sort of said uh, their peace and asked that everybody rest in peace. And this really led me to, to begin to question where the role, how the role of alcohol, the role of rum developed in the Caribbean, what were the cultural influences from Africa, from Europe, from indigenous peoples, how did the industry emerge? And so I've been spending the last 25, 30 years uh, working towards trying to understand what uh, the role of alcohol is in the Caribbean. And my research has been in the island of Barbados, which is highlighted here in a little red circle. It's a small island of some 230, 250,000 uh, people, also birthplace, home of Rihanna, um, uh, and my, many other great uh, track and field stars and musicians and politicians. Um, Barbados has had a disproportionate influence culturally uh, throughout the Atlantic world, throughout history. And it was uh, the wealthiest colony in uh, the British colonial Americas in the 17th century. Uh, largely as a result of sugar and rum. And it served as a model for the development of sugar industries in Jamaica and other parts of the British Caribbean. And so um, my research in Barbados has been uh, sort of culminated in many ways in 2005 or 2015, my time's mixed up when uh, I did work with the government of Barbados on their physical development plan. Every 10 years, Barbados puts together a physical development plan that looks at food security, um, climate change, all sorts of important issues, demographic change. And it was the first time that they really included a cultural heritage uh, management uh, uh, resources uh, protection. And so I was uh, honored to be chosen to, to work on that uh, cultural heritage management team. And a lot of our work has been aimed at um, sort of heritage tourism initiatives. And the reason I say that is because there's a lot of connections between the Caribbean and North America and Europe, Africa, South America, Latin America. Um, and so trying to sort of stimulate economic development through heritage efforts. And because uh, one of those heritage sites is Stratford Hall, uh, this is not Stratford Hall, this is actually St. Nicholas Abbey Sugar Plantation. Um, and I am director of archeology span and history at St. Nicholas Abbey as well as uh, many of the other things that I do. But thinking in terms of heritage management and building connections and heritage tourism, St. Nicholas Abbey was home to, uh, was founded by Sir John Yeamans, who set up the first uh, colony in the Cape Fear River in North Carolina, and eventually in Charlestown in South Carolina in 1674. So there's always been a sort of Barbadian connection to North America. Um, the other important site, which Kelly's uh, sister-in-law, Anna Agby Davies, actually did a great deal of archaeological work on was the George Washington House in Barbados. Uh, I think George Washington was 19 years old. In 1751, he visited Barbados with his uh, ill brother, Nathaniel, half-brother, and stayed there for seven weeks. He contracted yellow fever, uh, and it was the only place that Washington ever visited outside uh, the 13 continental colonies. And so looking at these connections uh, across the Atlantic world, looking at these connections um, to try and stimulate economic development, to try and uh, build a bridge through heritage um, across the Atlantic has been uh, much of my effort. And so, um, and the thing about Washington also in Barbados rum, which you will see that I'm a great advocate for Barbadian rum, is that at his inauguration, he requested only rum uh, be brought in from Barbados 
for the celebrations. So his short time in Barbados in 1751 continued on later on in his life. So beginning with rum, one of the things I've been looking at more recently is sort of popular cultural representations of rum. And rum is often associated with um, sort of danger, rebelliousness. Um, in the 1920s during prohibition, uh, the Bacardi family made a, a lot of money from American tourists who were visiting Cuba, uh, which is uh, uh, open to um, drinking while America was dry. Um, the song Rum and Coca-Cola by the Andrews sisters in the 1940s actually was about uh, uh, US military engaging uh, with Trinidadian prostitutes, the mixing of rum and Coca-Cola. Um, and then more recently, the sort of popularization of rum and pirates. And this all begins really with Robert Louis Stevenson's um, work, but it's been popularized more recently with Johnny Depp and Pirates of the Caribbean, 1929 picture uh, painting of the capture of Blackbeard. You can see the sort of bottle of rum uh, sort of rolling around on the deck as the uh, pirates are fighting till the end. But the reality of rum's uh, relationship to uh, pirates and the world in general is not quite as exciting as you would think. This is uh, Daniel Defoe, who in 1724 wrote the first history of pirates. And scouring his book, there's really no reference to rum or drunkenness. And most of the images that Defoe picks of, uh, depicts of pirates in the Caribbean uh, tend to portray them as relatively dashing and debonair. Most of them were business uh, men who were trying to make a little extra money or getting letters of mark. And so this sort of um, sensationalization of, of Roman piracy is, is um, tied to some truth, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, because one of the key pirates was uh, Sir Henry Morgan. And here's a popular representation of Morgan at the sacking of Panama where they basically stole all the gold and silver from the Spanish and they're here in negotiations. And you can see alcohol sort of bottles portrayed at the feet, uh, probably Spanish wine, but pirates and everybody drank pretty much anything they could find at the time. But the reality is that Sir Henry Morgan uh, later on in life became a sugar planter, went to Jamaica, had a plantation um, and Sir Hans Sloan, who was a physician, traveled to Jamaica the late 17th century and he visited Morgan on his plantation and Morgan at the time was dying. Uh, and Sir Hans Sloan, who some of you may know, it's, uh, has collections in the British Museum, has filled the British Museum in London with a lot of materials. He was also a physician and he described Morgan as jaundiced and yellow. And this is largely a result of his years of heavy drinking and liver cirrhosis. And so it's somewhat ironic that one of the most popular brands of rum today, Captain Morgan rum, is actually named for somebody who died early of liver cirrhosis. So one other character, just thinking about the maritime activities associated with rum is uh, Horatio Nelson, uh, Lord Nelson, uh, Admiral Nelson, who died at the Battle of Trafalgar, who helped defeat the French for the English. And when he was killed uh, in battle, uh, the crew of the ship put him in a cask of rum and sailed him back to England. And during that process and during that uh, trip, they 
tapped the cask of rum holding Nelson's body and drank from it in sort of something that was reminiscent of the Eucharist. And so, so rum has this sort of, um, sort of uh, elevation, this sort of sensationalization in the Western imagination. And the reality is that a lot of it has to do with just simply the challenges of life in the Caribbean, the challenges of life for maritime uh, people, sailors, merchant seamen um, who had long voyages across the Atlantic. Many of the sailors uh, um, saw rum as salubrious, as a way to treat a variety of different ailments. If you go to the Caribbean today, many people will tell you that rum is sort of the foundation, the uh, for many uh, cure-alls, for many medicines. Uh, children who get caught in the rain will get wiped down with rum. Uh, I have friends who will tell you that mosquitoes won't bite you as much if you drink a lot of rum. And there's a strong possibility to that, especially in a country where yellow fever was rampant, especially in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and so, uh, but there's this, and even the Royal Navy, uh, up until 1979, had a rum ration that was given to sailors every day as part of their uh, daily rum rations. Um, and part of this stemmed from originally uh, lobbying efforts by British planters in Barbados and Jamaica, who wanted to have contracts with the British Royal Navy to ensure uh, ongoing revenues for their rum. So it was a form of sort of uh, tariffs and protectionism. So Barbados, it's founded by the English in 1627. The first colonists there produced tobacco, cotton, and indigo. Uh, for the first 10, 20 years, Barbados was a small struggling island with a few thousand colonists, mostly English, Scots, Irish, Welsh, um, a few uh, enslaved Africans, and they simply couldn't compete with the um, larger, more productive tobacco producers in the Chesapeake region of the Mid-Atlantic. And so Barbados uh, remained for the first two decades a relatively quiet, sleepy little island. Uh, most of the labor was uh, conducted by indentured servants. Um, and one of the things that the English wanted was to try to recreate as closely as possible the things they left behind in England. And one of those things was beer and ale and other alcoholic beverages. And so they actually brought in 32 Carib Indians during the first trip. They sailed down to South America, uh, brought back 32 Carib Indians. There were Carib Indians throughout the Caribbean at this time. And this image is of the production of an alcoholic beverage called Wiku, which was produced uh, by chewing the root of the manioc plant uh, into a cassava cake and spitting it into a large jar where it would be allowed to ferment. It was boiled. It was served mostly to the men in uh, Carib Indian communities. And you can see them sort of dancing in the background, drinking and dancing. It's a story of the production, uh, consumption, and celebration of Wiku. And this was one of the drinks that the early colonists experimented with. They experimented with a variety of different uh, substances. They fermented plantains. They fermented pineapples. They fermented plums. They also produced a drink from sweet potatoes that was called mabi. And they also imported, when they could, uh, which was very expensive, beer and wine, mostly from Madeira, uh, during those early years of, of settlement. But things changed in the 1640s when the Dutch were kicked out of 
uh, northern Brazil in the region of Pernambuco, and those Dutch who were sugar planters and uh, sugar traders sought to reestablish their sugar industries, and they saw Barbados as a struggling island. And almost overnight, the Dutch, uh, with their money, their capital, their knowledge of sugar production, transformed Barbados uh, into a sugar producing island, the first major sugar producing island in uh, the British Carib Caribbean. Sugar was worth its weight in gold at this time. It was very valuable. And um, Barbados cut down all of its old growth forests. Uh, it was known as the Great Clearing and the Great Burning and essentially turned Barbados from one end of the island to the other end of the island into a sea of emerald green uh, sugarcane. And this had uh, uh, sugars different from other crops, from other uh, commodities that were being grown at this time. So unlike wheat, unlike cotton, unlike tobacco, um, sugar had to be processed. It had to be squeezed of its juice within 48 hours of being cut, or that juice would go sour. So it was known as sort of a factory in the field. Um, and it had this sort of semi-industrial character uh, to sugar production. Um, so not only was it uh, cultivated and harvested like other crops, but it also had this, this semi-industrial process of uh, processing which included boiling the sugarcane juice down to a viscid sort of syrup, allowing the molasses to drip out the bottom of the, um, uh, the barrels where the molasses was, or where the sugar was kept. And um, so yeah, it was a semi-industrial process which transformed Barbados, as I said, into the wealthiest colony in the 17th century, hundreds of ships arrived in Barbados each year. Uh, it was called the brightest jewel in the English crown because of all the wealth generated from sugar production. Uh, Barbados, Bridgetown itself was a, a socially diverse place, culturally diverse. There were uh, um, Ashkenazic, uh, Sephardic Jews. There was a synagogue. Um, there were people from all over the world traveling there, especially Dutch, who helped to um, fuel the rise of the trade in sugar from Barbados to Europe. And so as early as 1647, when the sugar industry is emerging, uh, an English royalist named Richard Ligon travels to Barbados, fleeing the Civil War in England, and he describes life on the island during this transitional period. And one of the things that he focuses on is uh, the rise of the emerging sugar industry. And he draws a plan of a still house and a sugar factory in 1647, which if you look in the upper left-hand corner, there is an image that shows that a distillery was already an essential part of a sugar factory in Barbados at this early stage. And what's important about this is that distilling itself was still a relatively new, uh, well, not new art, but uh, commercial distilling had become a relatively new art. Distilling is actually, um, goes back to the Muslim world. If you think about the word uh, alambek, al imbek, or alcohol, al kul, they're actually Arabic words. Um, and so distilling and the process of distilling goes back for many, many centuries, but the distilling of alcohol, aqua vitae, um, for convivial purposes is something that occurs relatively recently. Alcohol was originally distilled for medicinal purposes. Pharmacists, physicians distilled various tinctures that they thought would help people, but What's interesting is that the sugar industry in Barbados is emerging around the same time that knowledge of alcohol distillation is beginning to spread uh, throughout Europe. And it 
makes its way to Barbados at the very start of the sugar industry. And so Barbados is producing um, huge amounts of rum in this, almost from the very beginning of their, their sugar industry. This is an image of Martinique, Martinique in 1640 by Jean-Baptiste Duterte. And it also shows a sugar factory. And in that sugar factory, it also includes a small still. And if you look at the still close up, it's a very simple process with a, uh, um, an Allenbeck where the wash is sitting with a head, still head on top and a small tube running down through a cool barrel of water where it would be caught in a small uh, jar. And these were called uh, vinegaries, which is actually a reference to uh, vinegar making in France. So they're sort of taking their old world knowledge and applying it to uh, new world products, even at this time. Eventually the French uh, in the islands of Guadeloupe and Martinique um, and Saint-Domingue, which is today Haiti, um, became uh, and are some of the best producers of rum today, but because of restrictions placed on them by uh, France, uh, by lobbyists for the French wine and brandy interests in the 17th and 18th century. They had no home market for their rum. And one of the reasons why um, uh, the French had uh, so much molasses to sell it to New England distillers was because they basically had no home market for their rum. So they never distilled as much rum and they sold the molasses to North Americans in New England who distilled it themselves into rum, much to the disdain of the British government and British planters in Barbados. By the 18th century, small stills had been replaced by these large, what are known as goosenecks. Um, some plantations had stills that would hold as much as a thousand gallons, 2000 gallons. Um, rum had become so central to the economy of the plantation, usually representing somewhere between 10 and 15% of plantation revenues. This is an image from Antigua. Um, and you can see also by the 18th century, uh, the amount of rum being exported uh, was huge. During the 17th century, most of the rum that was produced in the islands stayed in the islands. It was consumed by the colonists, by the laborers. It was sent off on ships. Um, when ships would sail out of England, uh, they would be carrying with them mostly brandy, but they needed something for the way back and they would load their ships with rum. So this is how rum gets into the uh, into the mindset and the psyche of the English as early as the 17th century. So Barbados also sugar had a transformational revolutionary effect demographically. Uh, what was originally um, a majority large white uh, population of indentured laborers uh, emerges into one of the first major slave societies in uh, the Caribbean. And that's largely a result of the fact that sugarcane is a labor intensive crop. Uh, they needed large numbers of laborers and this helped to fuel um, the mid-Atlantic slave trade. Most of the work had to be done, especially during the, uh, the harvest and the processing season. Um, and so by the 1650s, uh, the population had shifted dramatically and the majority of the population were enslaved uh, peoples of African descent. And this led me to sort of explore, especially what was the role of alcohol within enslaved populations in Barbados. And this is a slave list. All plantations had a slave list of all the enslaved workers on an estate and this one individual here, Thomas, who is 37 years old, who is of uh, the Coromanti, who's Shanti. He was a cook and he's described here as someone who drinks as much as ever. 
So Thomas obviously was somebody uh, who drank heavily. And Thomas was one of maybe two, 300 people, uh, enslaved workers on this particular state in Jamaica. There's another individual on here also identified for their heavy drinking who happens to be a woman. So it doesn't suggest that alcoholism, alcohol abuse was something widespread, but enslaved peoples were given huge, significant portions of rum and daily, weekly rations for celebrations. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, looking for evidence of the drinking uh, habits, drinking practices of enslaved peoples in the Caribbean and in North America, you have to be really creative in your sources. And here's one uh, from Virginia about a runaway slave. This is a runaway slave uh, advertisement from the Virginia Gazette uh, of a runaway named Sandy who is greatly addicted to drink and when drunk is insolent and disorderly. Um, and so it's interesting that this is actually a uh, advertisement that was placed by Thomas Jefferson. And so you begin to look and see alcohol uh, within enslaved communities and ask um, what is the history of alcohol within slave communities, what role does it play within um, uh, enslaved communities? And so archeological work that I've done at sites like Maps Cave in Barbados have shown uh, that alcohol related archeological materials are widespread. Uh, they tend to survive well in the archeological record, um, but they also played an important role within uh, enslaved communities themselves. This is a jar known as a uh, conery in some cases, which is very similar to, um, and these were made in Barbados by enslaved potters, which um, uh, have a very distinct sort of West African um, uh, style and a very distinct West African uh, function. And these are found at sites uh, associated with enslaved peoples in Barbados, including Maps Cave, which I talk about in my second book. But this led me to explore what the role of alcohol was in uh, West Africa. And these pots, by the way, were used for the fermentation of an alcoholic beverage known as Guadarapo in the Spanish Caribbean or Grippo in the English Caribbean where it was a fermented beer. And enslaved peoples made these fermented beers from sugarcane juice, mix it with water, uh, the yeast, which are naturally present on the sugarcane, um, allowed to ferment. And it was a popular uh, drink within the British Caribbean by enslaved peoples. And this knowledge of alcohol production had come from various parts of West Africa, especially from the Akan, of what is today Ghana and the Igbo, what is today Nigeria, had a long history of alcohol production, alcohol consumption and use um, uh, that predated uh, the uh, colonization of the new world. And they produced what's known as palm wine, where they would tap the palm trees, the sap would be allowed to run into a large jar, or it would be allowed to ferment, and palm wine is still very popular in many parts of West Africa today. And what I was mostly interested in getting back to the, the sort of burial ground that we found in Bridgetown was what was the role, what role did alcohol play within uh, West African societies? And it was popular, important in birth ceremonies, marriage ceremonies and funerals as a way of sort of facilitating communication between the physical and the spiritual world. And you see this today, even in uh, voodoo practices in Haiti or Santeria practices in Cuba or Obia practices in Jamaica, where gifts of alcohol are often used to open lines of communication between the physical and the spiritual world. And these practices uh, survived the Middle Passage um, rum became an important trade item to West Africa. Uh, 
the argument could be made that uh, enslaved uh, peoples produced rum and therefore it had a greater symbolic value um, in West Africa because it was produced by brethren overseas. Um, and also uh, rum was uh, just simply uh, a valuable, important trade item that connected the Atlantic world. And many uh, enslaved peoples were already familiar with rum uh, when they arrived in the Caribbean because it had been uh, sold to various parts of West Africa. It was also sold to North America, the rum trade. And I throw this picture in here to show the connection to North Carolina. Rum was sold to uh, pitch pine tar uh, producers, to haymakers. Um, it was part of the broader Atlantic trades and it made its way into Virginia, the Carolinas and throughout the South and throughout the New England colonies as well. Throw this picture in here of Sam Adams because it reminds us that slavery is all around us. This famous image of, sorry, Paul Revere sitting at a mahogany table. And the mahogany table was actually from mahogany that was cut down in the Caribbean, probably uh, a table produced by enslaved peoples. Um, that throughout uh, our everyday lives, we are. Um, surrounded by uh, the legacies of slavery and uh, the vestiges of that institution. So planters doled out a significant amount of rum to enslaved workers as part of daily rations, as part of medicine, and for regular celebrations at Christmas and Easter, King's birthday, for a variety of different um, plantation events. In fact, Frederick Douglass um, argued that uh, he was just, in addition to being an abolitionist, Frederick Douglass was also a temperance advocate. Many people don't know this. And he uh, argued that, um, that if it weren't for the opportunity to sort of blow off steam on weekend or Sunday night events or Saturday night events, that it would have uh, led to slave revolts throughout North America. Um, because alcohol in many ways serves as a pressure valve, as a way to sort of blow off steam, as a way to sort of forget your troubles and to sort of escape temporarily. And planters thought about this as well as sort of a tool of domination, a way to keep enslaved peoples um, uh, from revolting, from rebelling, uh, was to satiate their uh, demands every now and then to have a little time to blow off steam. Uh, but many planters also worried it was a source of rebellion and it certainly was because uh, many of the largest slave uprisings in the Caribbean in Jamaica and in Barbados occurred during uh, Christmas celebrations, during Easter celebrations, when alcohol flowed free, freely and when uh, time on the plantations were much more relaxed. So it was uh, both a source of rebellion and a tool of domination. Women played an important role in the rum trade. Many of the women on estates took their uh, weekly rations down to the markets in Kingston and Bridgetown and sold them in exchange for various goods they needed for their children. This is Rachel Pringle. She is a matriarch, one of the national heroes of Barbados. She was uh, the owner of one of the most well-known popular taverns in all of the Atlantic world in the late 18th century. They even wrote a play <clears throat> about Rachel Pringle. It was very famous in London in the early 19th century. Um, and she was born uh, as a young woman uh, into slavery in Barbados. Um, the story is that uh, she was being beaten in the street one day by uh, her slave owner and that this British captain in the background here, British Admiral Prince, saved her and helped her get established as a tavern owner um, later on in life. You can see in Jamaica, this is an image of Jamaica, of a funeral in Jamaica in the late 18th, early 19th century where a young man is holding out a bottle of rum 
showing that the traditions, the West African traditions about the role of alcohol in uh, facilitating communication between the physical and spiritual worlds continued on in the new world. Uh, the Middle Passage did not destroy uh, African cultural traditions, African cultural knowledge, and you see this even today, as I said, in voodoo and Santeria ceremonies. Images of South Carolina uh, jumping the broom um, uh, celebration. You can see alcohol at the feet of the banjo player. And here in Barbados, an image of a weekend event. And again, a bottle of rum at the feet of uh, the musician there. Those who had the heaviest uh, reputation for drinking were actually indentured servants, poor whites. When Her Sir Hans Sloan goes to Barbados in the late 17th century, he tells stories about how um, some of the indentured servants would drink so much, they would fall off their horses at night and they would have their toes uh, and fingers snipped off by land crabs. Um, they also would simply drink themselves to death or exacerbate problems caused by yellow fever by drinking rum to sort of drive out the effects of yellow fever when in fact it was actually making things much worse for them. Um, sugar planters also had a reputation for heavy drinking and it was part of sort of the social life of uh, the plantocracy, the planter elite. This is an image from Suriname where you can see the planters are sort of losing themselves in alcohol and uh, topless women and fancy dress and tobacco. Uh, these were very wealthy people living on the frontier margins of the Atlantic world. You never see images of enslaved peoples drinking, but you'll often see them uh, serving alcoholic beverages to others. This is an image from Puerto Rico, and this is an image of Barbados. And what this image really highlights is the decadence of the plantation, the planter class. This white planter is here under an umbrella, and he's hunting birds, and all around him are empty bottles of alcohol. This is a jar of rum, uh, brandy, sangaree. It really shows the sort of, uh, tries to highlight the decadence or at least decadence that uh, metropolitan English thought of the plantocracies of the Caribbean. Stratford Hall, uh, planter elite there consumed a large amount of alcoholic beverages just to give you a sense of the connectedness to the Caribbean, there were over, I believe, Philip Ludwell's uh, probate inventory included 43 gallons of rum, 22 gallons of persimmon brandy, and more than 100 bottles of Madeira wine, also uh, Virginia wine. Uh, Richard Henry Lee in 1794 had more than 150 gallons of Jamaican rum available on the estate at that time and nearly another 100 gallons of rum from Antigua. So rum was used for paying workers, it was used for celebrating um, different events and hosting events. The variety of alcohol was also interesting because French brandy was very popular. Madeira wine was very popular at Stratford Hall, largely as a result of a treaty that had been signed in 1703 between the English and the Portuguese that allowed the English to stop in Madeira uh, to get water and to prepare for their long voyage across the Atlantic. Um, and this treaty led to a sort of desire and demand for Madeira wine, which was a sort of volatile, heavily fortified wine from, uh, from Madeira, which is still very popular today. But there was a great deal of Madeira at Stratford Hall. There was actually a still, an Alembec in uh, the dairy at Stratford Hall, uh, which I'd like to find more uh, about at some point. 
But the decadent lifestyles of the planter class, whether it's in Virginia, or the Carolinas, or Jamaica, or Barbados, uh, is evident in the heavy drinking, and the sort of uh, nouveau riche lifestyle of the plantocracy. It was also part of gentlemanly honor. Um, you could not uh, pass by a neighbor's house without going in for a drink. And if you did, uh, you were, it was a real affront to, uh, to the honor of the, uh, whoever was inviting you in to drink. Um, many of the images here, this is the tavern scene actually, I think from Amsterdam, but these types of archeological materials are abundant. Um, uh, throughout archaeological sites in Barbados, associated with the English colonists, especially in the capital of Bridgetown, which, as I said, was an incredibly wealthy place with travelers coming in from and visitors from all over the Atlantic world. Running out of time. And um, uh, I did punch bowls. Uh, were quite popular. Punch uh, was an exotic drink. It contained a great deal of exotic ingredients, which made it uh, um, proper for its day. Uh, it showed the interconnectedness of the Atlantic world, also to India. But I also think rum was important because it was sort of entering this industrial age as capitalism was emerging that the days of beers and ales and wines were great when you were working on a farm, cutting hay in Leicestershire, but not so great when you're living in London. And so what's interesting is you begin in Barbados uh, with the rum industry and with the rise of gin making, the rise of whiskey making in North America in the late 18th uh, early 19th century, you always see this sort of binge followed by a sort of period of leveling out and abstinence. And just some images of some of the artifacts uh, quickly. This is a stoneware, Dutch uh, brandy jar, Bartman Krug, uh, punch bowl found in Bridgetown, Barbados, a Staffordshire loving cup, Kelly probably finds many similar objects at many of the sites she's dug in Virginia. These are porcelain wine cups, a decanter stopper, more porcelain wine cup bases from Chinese porcelain, another Bartman Krug with its face on it, 17th century, a Delft uh, wine cup, and I will leave it there um, and ask uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to, I'm kind of all over the place there, I feel oh, like. I love it, I love it, I love it. You had some really fantastic slides. Sorry, I'm yelling again for the one person that needed me to okay. tone down my microphone. That was fantastic, Fred. So what I love about your work is that you're interdisciplinary, right? So you're an archeologist, but you're a historian. You also sort of look at the cultural stuff and you know, you bring together these beautiful threads to really tell a story about not just rum, but the people that were drinking it, right? The Atlantic world, etc. So we definitely have some questions. That was fantastic. Loving all of that. I could listen to that over and over and over again. Okay, let's do this. Okay, fun, fun. All right, Michael asks, are you ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> Did turning Barbados into a sugar monoculture create pests that attack the crops? Pests? Um... Right. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because in Barbados today, there are mong mongoose, mongooses uh, all over the island that were brought in to kill the snakes, but there weren't that many snakes in Barbados. So now there are mongooses all over the island. Um, uh, it is really interesting to kind of look at the impact of biodiversity. I mean, what there's so much we'll never know because of the great clearing, and the types of insects. But some of the early naturalists did some pretty good drawings of uh, uh, some of the lizards, for example, and other things on the island. But yes, rats were a big problem. 
the English brought cats with them everywhere they went. They loved cats. Cats? cats. <laughs> and the cats killed a lot of rats. They also killed a lot of birds, a lot of bird species, um, have faced challenges as a result of that. I uh, bet. But that's a good question. I've never. It is a really interesting. So you had mentioned the uh, folks getting their toes and things oh. sort of chopped off by crabs. And it reminded me my stepmom, she her grandfather was friends with Darwin and traveled around with him back in the 19th century. And there's a, a beautiful like sketch that he did of a crab with a toe in his claw. <laughs> and I never understood it until now. So. I mean, it really amazing when you read these stories. I mean, because the life was just dull, you know, and you needed to <laughs> escape. And they a lot of the early colonists just lost themselves in drinking. And so, you know, they were just, you know, they were described as bruised from falling off their horses at night. They would fall asleep and, you know, on the streets and like you know, all these, you know, would catch cold from sleeping on the streets or get yellow fever, or attacked by mosquitoes. They would blow up their houses because the rum sometimes was made to such a high concentration that <laughs> they lit the, you know, first light of their tobacco pipe, you know, <laughs> go up. So there was a, it was a dangerous time, you know, and alcohol can lead to some dangerous consequences, you know. But you know, maybe you're not getting yellow fever because you're drinking so much of it. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I, I had a very good friend of mine in Barbados tell me that mosquitoes did not bite her when she drank. And she said that the reason why we drink rum so much is because it keeps the mosquitoes away. And I really want to do a study on this find an entomologist somewhere, you know, that wants to study, like, you know, if you could test, like people who drink rum, people who don't drink rum, see how many times they get bit by mosquitoes. Right. They don't, so there's gotta Super be- Super fascinating. There has to be something there in the future, for sure. All right, and Andrew has a question. He says, what was the split between export of rum from Barbados or elsewhere in the, in the British Caribbean versus export of sugar or molasses? distilling elsewhere so you know percentage of I know Barbados was big with rum for a long time but go ahead and answer that question I mean and it's a good question because um when um Barbadians had a reputation for double distilling for producing a slightly better quality of rum whereas the Jamaicans would distill their rum to 100 percent alcohol put it in barrels and then ship it across the Atlantic where it would be adulterated with water in London back down to, you know, 60, 40 split. So it's hard to say, but a lot of it also had to do with the price of sugar because when sugar prices would low, the planters would turn their sugar into rum and the rum as it ages becomes more valuable and so it was worthwhile to just store their rum when sugar prices were low, turn it into, turn the sugar into rum. And then um, when rum prices uh, go back or go high, you can sell the rum at a good price. So the same Very thing happened with corn in, uh, in North America after the American Revolution. So, so cool. Adrian asks, what do you think about all of the different flavored rums? Is it better to have it pure? You know, uh, that's a good question because um, back in the, in the colonial days, they used to mix rums also with a ver variety of different ingredients. And one of the things, especially for illnesses, like, because um, the idea is when you drink rum, it's hot, mm -hmm. but when you have a cold, you know, when you feel chilled, it's going to counter the effects of the chill. So you want to consume something hot. And, you know, when you drink rum, straight rum, it's like warm as you go down. Yeah. It burns, right? And so the idea is you're reintroducing heat back into your body. And they would add uh, hot peppers in some cases to, um, to the rum to give it a little more kick, right? Love it. Yeah. So, but flavored rums, I don't know. Uh, I'm kind of a purist, I think. I still kind of like, I mean, it's interesting in the 1950s, the, um, 
were rum diaries, actually. Hunter S. Thompson, you know, wrote about Puerto Rico. They were doing some great stuff with, um, there was a chemist uh, who, was, who was like refining the knowledge of uh, rum making uh, to such an art because it was really a, a kind of craft. It was a rule of thumb. They didn't know what yeast was in the 1700s. Right. So I didn't really understand the whole process. They just like pour this into this and then next thing you know, it like ferments. Starts bubbling. <laughs> So like microorganisms, what's that, you know? <laughs> um, so there, uh, so, so like there are all these little esters and essential oils that I think um, it would be hard to recreate what a, what a true rum in the 17th or 18th century tasted like, you know? Yeah, I went to Grenada a few years ago on a research trip and apparently they have the oldest working distillery, you know, in the Western hemisphere fear. And I, I tasted that rum. I, have to say. Uh, <laughs> I felt like a pirate at that moment. And it wasn't a good thing. It, was, it was all fire. I mean, there was nothing else. I really felt like I just grabbed like some turpentine or something and, and threw it down, but it was very exciting to sort of taste that history. But that recipe apparently hadn't changed in forever, and it was not pleasant, let's say. Yeah, and and so the, along the lines of this, I mean, rum punch is essentially the cocktail of its day, right? Because yeah. you're taking limes, you're taking sugar, you're mixing it with rum, you throw a little nutmeg in there. <laughs> so, you know, that's the the kind of mojito, the I don't know, cocktail of its you know, <laughs> of its time. And only the elite, you know, really could afford to combine those materials. So right. it sort of reinforced your, your status, you know, so. Love it. All right, Adrian asks, what's your favorite rum? I love Gosling's Black Rum. Oh, it's a very nice rum. And when I was in Bermuda, <laughs> that was one of the first bottles of rum I actually added to my collection. It is quite nice. <laughs> very nice rum uh, and very good with ginger beer. I mean, it's a dark and stormy. Dark and stormy, yep. Um, I will actually, if you wait. Ooh, we're going to get, while he's grabbing that, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what my new favorite is. And it's from Haiti. You can see this right here. It is inexpensive and it is delicious. It is not very hot. It's actually very smooth rum. And it's called Bobacourt or Bobincourt. Barbincourt. Barbincourt, yes. It's fantastic. Very smooth. He was actually, Barbincourt was actually a, a French brandy distiller. Interesting. Whom, and he migrates to Haiti after the Haitian Revolution. So, okay. So it's interesting. Um, you know, the sort of, it's like Bacardi is Catalonia. I think they're Catalan family. From, really? <laughs> they go to Cuba. So there's all this sort of stuff going on in the uh, early 19th century. But yeah, this so is interesting. This is my uh, oh, St. Nicholas Abbey. I have some of that downstairs. <laughs> it's pretty fantastic. Also, it's a Chanel bottle, by the way. <laughs> That's very fancy, though. <laughs> Is your name engraved on it, Fred? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Batch number is all on the back and everything. Oh, my goodness. So it's got a, I mean, I do like the rum. They do make a nice rum. Um, Mount Gay Extra Old is also very good. But, you know, globalization is taken over, you know? Like Bacardi rum, the reason why there's so much Bacardi rum in the United States is because after the Cuban Revolution, the Bacardi family moved to Puerto Rico and the Reagan administration wanted to, you know, create a, a barrier to the spread of communism and bolster Puerto Rico's economy. And so one of the ways it did it was in, give these sort of preferential trade tariffs to the Bacardi rum. <laughs> so that's why you see Bacardi rum on every- Everything. Show. Yeah. So, um, but the rum today is, it's made in Vietnam. It's made in yeah. Puerto Rico. It's and it's all blended. The Philippines in. have apparently some of the best rum out there right now, which is kind of crazy. Although you know, I'm biased towards the Caribbean, but <laughs> I, you know, but the last few years, the Latin American, the Guatemalan, and Honduras, yeah, uh, Florida Cana is a Nicaragua, um, 
Nicaraguan rum. They've done some really nice stuff. So cool. Let's see here. All right, more questions. Melinda says that her husband read a book called Cod, a biography of the fish that changed the world, in which the author said that enslaved people working on sugar plantations in the Caribbean were fed salted cod, and that helped support and grow the cod industry in New England. Are you familiar with this? Yeah, so, um, and our family, my father's family is from Providence. Uh, <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't come to Providence until the 19th century, but, um, but the fishing industry, it is so interesting because these are all commodities, right? So, I, and I love commodity history. So the salt that was used to salt the cod was done through a process of salt raking where New Englanders would sail down to the Caribbean or to other parts of Latin America and um, rake salt and then bring it back to salt the fish. I mean, so it it's really about capitalism. It's really about you know, sort of the emergence of, of this sort of network of global capitalism. Um, but, and, and absolutely, I mean, a lot of that cod was uh, paid for um, with rum. I mean, the breadfruit, which Captain Bly brings to Jamaica from the South Pacific is brought, you know, mutiny on the bounty. He's trying to bring breadfruit to the Caribbean to feed enslaved populations. And today there's breadfruit throughout the Caribbean and Captain Bly goes on to become the governor of, of Australia where he bans the consumption of rum and the making of rum in Australia. So I don't know, it's all interesting. But anyway, yeah, cod industry, very important. Nutmegs, you name it. Um, and you know, Kelly, I mean, a lot of it's like your father's work, you know, like your father was, uh, his work in historical archaeology in terms of like understanding the structural, the binary oppositions, you know, the way that we think. Um, I think that there's something between the sort of modern um, versus, you know, uh, nature, you know, nature, nature versus civilization, modern versus uh, pre-modern, you know, and how do you wrangle with that? Right. And so rum is rum and sugar and all these other things are really sort of part of this modern world, you know, and you so want true. to be so. <laughs> uh, Daniel asks, what records have you come across from the Lee family and their neighbors with regards to rum consumption in the revolutionary era? So, I mean, you've seen the records that we have. They were definitely drinking it. Lots of it. <laughs> I mean, I, Judy sent me some wonderful documents and like, there's there's a dissertation there's a at least a thesis in here um but it's not just the i mean the amount of rum is fascinating and as you said lee had connections to the caribbean he was obviously trading back and forth but there's also a huge amount of madeira wine there's french brandy but you know what there's not a lot of is whiskey and that's because whiskey consumption doesn't really take off until after the American Revolution, when whiskey is made from American corn, it's a patriotic drink, whereas rum is sort of the uh, holdover, it's sort of seen as sort of a legacy of colonialism, of British colonialism. And so you see the shift from um, this decline in rum drinking and this increase in whiskey drinking around the late 18th century. And there's not much whiskey uh, at uh, Stratford Hall. Um, there's Virginia wine, which is interesting. There's some crazy pork berry bounce. Yeah. <laughs> some crazy uh, drinks that they made from persimmon wine, persimmon uh, brandy was another yeah. one. So, I mean, people, you know, like it's boring sometimes, you know, and you got to find a way to get through a dull day. Let's make some brandy and drink it and make life a little more interesting, you know. That's so true. So Charles asks, uh, was there a large industry in barrel and glass bottle making in relationship to the liquor? So that's a, a really interesting question because um, Eric Williams, who was the prime minister of Trinidad, wrote this great book in the 1940s 
called Capitalism and Slavery, where he basically argues that if it wasn't for the sugar industries in the Caribbean, that the industrial revolutions in Europe never would have or would have taken place much later, but that the demand for bottles, the demand for barrel staves, the demand for cod, the demand for breadfruit, the demand for iron, um, for copper, for, you know, for the stills, um, all these sort of demands for clothing for enslaved workers helped to stimulate industries in Europe, which led to um, the rise of sort of the industrial revolution. So, but that's an interesting question. Super interesting. Melinda asks, what is the difference between dark rum and light rum? So a dark rum has been aged in a oak barrel. Um, and a lot of the, the aging they do is from old whiskey barrels from, um, from Tennessee and Kentucky, bourbon barrels. And over time, it just leaches out that color. Whereas a white rum has been filtered, but it's usually been aged, it hasn't been aged or if it has been aged, it's been aged for such a short amount of time that it doesn't have time to absorb any of the colors. And a lot of comp a lot of um, rum uh, brands will actually add molasses to give it a darker color uh, because it's seen as more uh, refined. But this is true. That battle I showed you is true. It's like a rum has sort of an almond color and yeah that's sort of the perfect sort of color to, to have i don't i'm not a big fan of white rums at all i mean i haven't had saint nicholas abbey's white rum but and then once i had that rum in grenada i never ever wanted to even think about that ever again all right uh, bobby asks i read that different planting methods for sugarcane were experimented with since hurricanes could wipe out an entire crop what do you know about farming methods to anticipate the hurricane season? And how did business practices deal with rum shortages when they occurred? It's the Caribbean hurricane season is a known factor. So yeah, how did, what's the intersections of like the economy and hurricanes and production? So uh, really interesting also in, um, because sugarcane is usually, or was on an 18 month cycle. And so, um, so they were planted like fields were planted like six months apart. And so the harvest season um, was usually before the height of the hurricane season so that you would be able to get your product on a ship sent over to Europe before the hurricanes would start. Um, what's interesting about the growing, the sugarcane techniques uh, is that the cane in the 18th century, um, they started experimenting with new types of sugar cane from Tahiti. And so the Otaheite cane is the cane that you find in the Caribbean today. Um, and I forget what the original canes had come from the Mediterranean through Italy. Columbus brought sugar cane on like his second or third voyage. Yeah. And so it was a different uh, variety of cane that for the first hundred years or so uh, dominated. And then the Otaheite canes were juicier, they were bigger, they were could withstand things more. Um, but that's a, I mean, but drought and hurricanes and fires, volcanoes or right? you know, <laughs> earthquakes, you know, sinkholes, I mean, you name it. I mean, there were so many uh, potential disasters to to sugar canes you know fires are the big ones you know like even today like you say the word cane fire and people are just like the, yeah. <laughs> yeah i bet all right linda who's a a, a long time a supporter here of these programs has a really interesting question so she wants to know about the environmental factors like the soil and those kinds of things like how much does that affect the different rums that are grown on different islands and then she has a wonderful a second question of um do you have any good recipes so <laughs> two things thank you linda 
Um, I mean, it is interesting that, um, so, uh, so a good French wine, right, is a terre noir, right, from the, the soils of a particular chateau, right? And so the problem, and so um, in the Caribbean, there are a few, especially in the French Caribbean, they've adopted that sort of terre noir idea that it's from the earth and that the soils and the um, uh, moisture of a particular region of Martinique produce a particularly good rum. Um, Appleton rum in Jamaica is kind of like that. Mount uh, St. Nicholas Abbey rum, um, Mount Gay rum. But what's happened because of globalization and the demand for rum is that a lot of rum is just kind of mixed together, you know, unless it's like a real specialty brand, a lot of it is um, sort of distilled, put on a cargo ship to Baltimore, <laughs> Maryland, where it's then blended with like rum from everywhere else. And <laughs> it doesn't have its, it's a real clear taste. So Bacardi is sort of like that. But, <laughs> But the rum, the fact when you went to in Grenada, Westerhall, I think it was, oh. <laughs> they stay still. Yeah. I mean, so some do it well, some people don't, you know, um, it's a, it's a challenge, but, uh, but it's Linda, um, rum punch. So there's an old saying for rum punch and, um, it's one of sour, two of sweet three of strong and four of neat. And that, yeah, that's the, the rum punch recipe. And so the one of sour, I think it's one of sour. I uh, have to find it's out. It's like the lime or something, right? Lime juice, right? Uh, two of sweet is uh, brown sugar. Three of strong is three parts rum. <laughs> and sometimes an extra part if you're really feeling barbated. <laughs> four parts water and then a little bit of nutmeg on the top and oh, i love that meg that true. sounds fantastic yeah. i love it all right we are out of questions anybody else any looming lingering questions that you want to ask uh, dr smith here the doctor of rum if you will before we hop off here and enjoy the rest of the saturday evening Looks like that is it. So thank you so much, Fred. It is always a pleasure to hang out and talk with you. Your talk was really interesting. Your book, again, for those of you that love a good read, and literally this is fantastic. It is Caribbean, I'm trying to get it, Caribbean <laughs> rum. Okay. Uh, this really doesn't do very well. The yeah. Avengers. When uh, it doesn't work. Anyways, it's Caribbean rum. Oh, we've got four <laughs> questions popped up. Maybe they're just thank yous. Okay. Thanks for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, of course. Of course. We love all of you. Um, so yeah, so get his book. It's written beautifully. And again, the research in there and the way that you present it. I mean, I think a lot of people that have PhDs can really do the research, but the ways in which you tell those stories, I mean, I could literally just read your book and sit around sipping rum and just absorb all the beautiful information. So thank you for writing that as well. Thank you, Kelly. You're a sweetheart. That was very sweet, sweet. And uh, it's you, sincere. Anybody wants to send me an email? Anybody has any questions? Go ahead. Uh, you can find my email, North Carolina. Yeah. And thank you guys uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my research with you. And Absolutely. We will have you back. Maybe when COVID's over, we can do a rum tasting program in person at Stratford. I would love to do that. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. See you all on um, the next program that we're doing is actually me. It's at the end of the month. And I will be talking about some of the really fascinating things that um, have been found in the walls at Stratford. So check out stratfordhall.org for more information on that. Sign up. It's another free event. And thank you all for zooming in. Have a wonderful night and cheers, Fred. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers.